Hello everyone and welcome to this RCET webinar, Applications of Carbon Dioxide Measurements for Climate Related Studies from July 9th through the 16th, 2024. My name is Erica Podest and I am an RCET instructor as well as a scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory where I specialize in studying terrestrial ecosystems with satellite data. This training has three sessions. The second session will be tomorrow, Wednesday, July 10th, and the third session will be on Tuesday, July 16th, all at the same time. Today's session will focus on explaining CO2 measurements from the OCO2 and OCO3 missions. There will be an overview of the missions and a discussion of the characteristics and limitations of the data. The training objectives for this webinar are the following. By the end of the training, participants will be able to identify the characteristics and limitations of uh, CO2 data from the OCO2 and OCO3 missions. There will be several demos, so participants will learn how to access and download data through the um, Data Archive Center, known as GESDIS. And uh, participants will be able to open and visualize uh, CO2 data from OCO2 and OCO3, as well as interpret XCO2 data or CO2 data from these two missions at global, regional, and local scales. Um, we'll be showing participants the uh, quality flags that are incorporated into the data sets, so participants will be able to assess the level of confidence in the CO2 measurements. Um, through these quality flags. And there will be a demo on uh, analyzing OCO2 data for assessing the impacts of an El Nino event uh, using CO2 concentrations and, and um, CO2 fluxes over tropical regions, as well as another demo showing you how to analyze OCO3 data to assess variations in CO2 concentrations over a metropolitan area. And this is the agenda for this uh, webinar series. There are three sessions. The next one will be tomorrow, Wednesday, July 10th, on the impacts of drought on CO2. It will include a demo on how to use OCO2 data to assess the impacts of drought from an El Nino event. Um, and the third session will be on Tuesday, July 16th. It will be on CO2 measurements over a large urban area. So the demo associated with that session will be on the use of OCO3 data over a large metropolitan area. There is a homework associated with this webinar series. We will open the homework on the last um, uh, day, on session three. So on Tuesday, July 16th, we will open the homework, and the homework will be due on August 9th. There uh, will be a certificate of completion given to participants that attend all the live sessions and complete the homework by the due date. How to ask questions? Please write your questions in the questions box and we will address them at the end of the webinar. Um, so there will be a Q&A uh, period at the end of the presentation. Feel free to enter your questions as we go along, and we will try to answer all of the questions during the Q&A session. If we don't get to your question, all of the questions will be answered in a uh, document, in a Google document. So we will compile all of your questions on a Google Doc, and we will answer all of your questions on this doc, which we will post onto the training website in a couple of days. The prerequisite for this training is a previous training on CO2 from OCO2 and OCO3. That was an introductory training in 2022 titled Measuring Atmospheric Carbon Dioxide from Space in Support of Climate-Related Studies. And this training, this, this webinar series, um, the current one, will build on what was covered there. So. We will still do a summary. We will review some of the material, but we'll build on the basics that were covered in that first training. So review of prior knowledge for your reference. The spaceborne measurements of atmospheric CO2 are becoming 
increasingly important and relevant um, in support of climate studies and to inform policy decisions. And NASA's OCO2 and OCO3 missions are dedicated to providing these measurements and uh, other measurements that are very important as well, such as solar-induced chlorophyll fluorescence, or SIF. Measurements of atmospheric CO2 can be used in conduction, conjunction with models to infer CO2 fluxes. We'll talk a little bit about that. And um, uh, CO2 flux estimates derived from OCO2 and OCO3 data are used to constrain net biosphere exchange and net carbon exchange between the land and ocean surfaces and the atmosphere. The OCO2 and OCO3 data also help constrain emissions from hotspots such as urban areas, megacities, and power plants. So the objectives for this session, this first session, is for participants to be able to identify the characteristics and limitations of XCO2 measurements from OCO2 and OCO3 and uh, explore applications area where these measurements are useful and um, as well as to be able to identify where to access and how to use the quality flags in a data set for assessment of the measurement. And finally, interpret data and address the considerations for using CO2 in different application areas. Today's guest speaker is Dr. Vivian Payne from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. She is a project scientist for the Orbiting Carbon Observatory 2, or OCO2, and the deputy project scientist for OCO3. She was guest speaker for the first OCO RSET training back in 2022, and we're truly privileged to have her back for this training. Thank you very much, Dr. Payne, and welcome back. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Erica, for that overview. Um, and now we're going to move into the material for part one, where we're going to talk about XCO2 from OCO2 and OCO3. We're going to do a recap of the missions and talk about data characteristics, characteristics and limitations. All right, so the missions themselves. Let's talk about the missions. So the motivation for these space-borne missions um, is, of course, that carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is warming our planet. And about two-thirds of that heating comes from human-produced greenhouse gases. We know that carbon dioxide is at the highest point in our atmosphere that it's been for at least 800,000 years. And we know that from ice core records. Um, and we know from recent years that the CO2 um, growth rate in our atmosphere is higher than it has been um, and that the increases are now happening at an unprecedented rate. So we want to keep an eye on CO2. Um, CO2 has been measured in situ at ground sites for multiple decades. And the figure on this slide is the Keeling curve um, which is an iconic scientific figure. It's named after the scientist Charles David Keeling, who began a record of carbon dioxide measurements at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii and started that in 1958, and that's been continued ever since. Mauna Loa, out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, is considered to be remote from strong sources or emissions, um, and also remote from strong sinks or removals of CO2 from the atmosphere. So the measurements out there can be regarded as an estimate of background CO2 for the Northern Hemisphere. And this curve here shows the variation in atmospheric CO2 at Mauna Loa over time. The red curve shows measurements at monthly resolution and the black curve shows a smoothed version of that. And there are two main features of the curve that I want to point out. Firstly, we can see a seasonal variation in the red curve. Um, so you can see that in winter in the northern hemisphere, the CO2 builds up. And in the summer, in the growing season in the northern hemisphere, the plants draw down the CO2. So we get that seasonal cycle of increase and decrease. And then during, um, let's see, secondly, there's a very obvious growth over time in the atmospheric CO2 over the time period. And that growth is not linear. 
So you can see from this curve here that the growth rate has been increasing over time. We know that the overall growth is driven by human activity, by the burning of fossil fuel. We also know that the anthropogenic emissions, those human emissions, are offset to some extent by natural sinks, such as uptake by plants, also by the oceans. However, there are still many open questions about the locations, the strength and the nature of the CO2 sources and sinks, and how those are changing over time. So this is the data set from Mauna Loa. There are other in situ measurement sites besides Mauna Loa that provide extremely accurate measurements of CO2 over multiple decades. However, um, the locations of these sites were generally chosen to be in so-called background locations, so far from the sources and sinks themselves. And on a global scale, the ground-based network of in situ measurements is very sparse. So that brings us to the motivation for having satellite measurements. Satellites, of course, can provide global scale coverage and also long term measurements, not as long as the ground based record, but we're, we're building up that record. So in this course, we're going to focus on two NASA missions that are dedicated to studying CO2 in our atmosphere, the OCO2 and OCO3 missions. So OCO2 was launched in July 2014. Um, it's in a what we call a sun synchronous polar orbit. So it passes over the same location um, at the same given time every day as a 16 day repeat cycle. It's measuring both the column average CO2 or XCO2, which we'll talk about more later, as well as um, a quantity called solar induced fluorescence, which is a, a measurement of the photosynthetic activity of plants. And OCO3, the Orbiting Carbon Observatory 3, is a sister mission to OCO2. It was launched in May 2019. Um, it's installed on the International Space Station. And the International Space Station, or ISS, flies in an inclined orbit. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about what that means later. And again, it's measuring column average CO2 and the solar-induced fluorescence. So the length of the satellite records is not as long as the record from the ground-based measurements, but it is ever growing. And the spaceborne measurements can't match the accuracy of the in situ measurements, but they can provide large scale and sustained coverage to get a view that can complement other types of CO2 measurements in order to better quantify the sources and sinks and what's happening with them over time. Now, this figure shows one kind of visualization of the carbon dioxide record from OCO2. The x axis shows the time dimension, the y axis shows latitude, and the z axis shows carbon dioxide values. So you can see here the same features that we were looking at in the Keeling curve. We can see the seasonal cycle. If you look at the northern hemisphere, we can see that seasonal cycle repeating over multiple years as the plants take up CO2 in the growing season and release CO2 in the winter. You can also see that the seasonal cycle is much less pronounced at the southernmost latitudes because there's less land and less plants in the southern hemisphere overall. And then also from this figure, you can see the increase in CO2 values over time. So the blue, the purpley blue values on this show lower values of carbon dioxide and the red values show higher values of carbon dioxide. And of course, with the satellite, you can get a global view um, as opposed to just a time series of isolated points. I'll also take the opportunity here to just point out the size of the scale on this um, color bar here. So you can see that the variation of carbon dioxide across the globe um, from pole to pole is relatively small. You're looking at small variations against a large background. And so we need very accurate and precise measurements enabled in order to be able to use them for estimation of sources and sinks. Now this next um, slide shows animations of OCO2 and OCO3 coverage over the time that they overlap. And if I play the animation, then you can just see the sampling over time. So each frame here shows 16 days worth of data. 
Um, with OCO2, you can see here that we get almost pole to pole coverage. It depends a bit on the season, and we'll talk a bit more about that later. We said OCO2 is in a sun synchronous orbit, so a polar orbit. That means it has a fixed equator crossing time. Um, so it uh, passes over the equator at um, 1 30 p.m. local time um, every day. Um, it always has the same local overpass time, and it has that 16-day repeat cycle, which is very predictable, um, and you can map out into the future. OCO3, um, on the inclined orbit of the space station, um, you can see due to the orbit of the space station, the latitudinal coverage for OCO3 is um, limited to between plus or minus 52 degrees in latitude. You can also see that that coverage varies quite a lot as we move between seasons. Um, one thing about the inclined orbit is that the observations span all times of day. So OCO2 is measuring at the same local time every day. Um, OCO3, we get sampling of different times of day. Um, but again, that sampling varies in time. It takes some time to build up um, the coverage of multiple times of day for any given location on the Earth. All right, if we go to the next slide. So the um, satellite instruments have different observing modes that we'll talk about here. OCO3, also, sorry, OCO2 has three different observing modes. Um, the first one that we'll talk about is nadir mode. And in this mode, the instrument looks straight down. Nadir mode is the mode that gives us the highest spatial resolution, um, so it makes it easier to look between clouds. It gives the smallest spatial footprint on the ground. Um, the downside of nadir mode is that over ocean surfaces, at the wavelengths we measure with OCO2, um, we get very poor signal to noise over the ocean. So we also have this glint mode, um, where the spacecraft points the instrument towards the so-called glint spot where solar radiation is reflected from the surface. Um, and at high latitudes, that gives us up to 100 times better signal to noise than the um, nadir measurements. So we can use the glint mode to get measurements over ocean. The third mode to talk about is this target mode. In target mode, the observatory locks onto a specific surface location um, and stares at that as we fly overhead. So that target mode is useful for um, targeting validation sites uh, so that we can get good location with ground-based measurements. Um, and we can use those to help correct and identify and correct systematic and random errors in the product. So that's OCO2. Um, OCO3 has an additional observing mode, a unique observing mode. Um, OCO3 has a pointing mechanism assembly that allows us to do this special snapshot area mapping. So the snapshot area mapping mode is unique to OCO3. It allows us to collect data over around an 80 by 80 kilometer area in the course of two minutes. And that allows us to focus on localized emissions from human activities like megacities or power plants or even landfills by mapping over those areas. And that's a really great complement to the nadir and glint measurements from the routine operations. And in this animation on this slide, we're looking at a snapshot area map observation over a large power plant. This is the Belkatov power plant in Poland where we consistently see large CO2 plumes coming out from that plant. So we'll now move on and talk a little bit more about the measurement itself. So what is the XCO2 measurement? Well, XCO2, when we talk about XCO2, we're talking about the column average volume mixing ratio of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So the column average volume mixing ratio um, gives us a measure of that average amount of gas in a vertical column above a given location. Um, so that's describing the average over the full atmospheric column all the way from the surface to the top of the atmosphere. 
Um, and just as an aside, um, for our OCO2 and OCO3 products, when we talk about volume mixing ratio, we're talking about the volume mixing ratio with respect to dry air. And how do we make that measurement? Well, the OCO2 and OCO3 instruments are spectrometers. They measure reflected sunlight in these three bands in the near infrared spectral region. We have the oxygen A band at 0.76 microns, the weak CO2 band at 1.6 microns, and the strong CO2 band at 2.06 microns. So the spectrometers measure the spectral fingerprint of carbon dioxide, and the absorption levels in the spectra provide information on how many CO2 molecules were in the atmospheric path that's viewed by the instrument. The OCO2 and OCO3 spectrometers are essentially the same. The OCO3 spectrometer was originally built as a flight spare for OCO2, um, so they're measuring at the same spectral range, same spectral resolution. So we measure these radiant spectra in these three bands, and then um, we process that data further to get to an end product that you can use for looking at atmospheric carbon dioxide. So the figures that we saw on the previous slide were these um, level 1b calibrated radiant spectra. Um, we do some pre-screening, which we'll talk about a little more we do a retrieval on the radiances to get to a level 2 um, XCO2 product, and then we do some further filtering and bias correcting, which again we'll talk about a little more later, um, to produce this light data product, which is what we recommend for most users. So I said that the OCO2 and OCO3 spectrometers are essentially the same but they do view the atmosphere a little differently. We already saw that the two instruments are in two different orbit geometries, with OCO2 in a polar orbit and OCO3 in an inclined orbit. Um, the projected footprints at the ground are also a little different. So the figures on this slide show a couple of different examples of the ground footprints for so-called simultaneous nadir overpasses. And um, these are cases where the instruments pass over the same location on the Earth at essentially the same time. On these maps here, the red and blue colours show what we call continuum radiances from the oxygen A band. Um, if you think back to the spectra we looked at earlier, the continuum radiance is a measure of the radiance that the instrument measures in the gaps between the absorption lines. So we're looking at the continuum radiances for these simultaneous nadir overpasses as one way of checking that the measurements from the two instruments are consistent. I can tell you that we've checked this pretty carefully and the oxygen A-band radiances are indeed consistent. But the main point really for showing these figures here was to demonstrate the difference in the footprints that the instruments project onto the ground. So the OCO2 instrument is on its own pre-flying spacecraft. It's on a fixed orientation on the spacecraft. And the spacecraft rotates as it moves along the orbit in order to mitigate polarization effects. This has the effect of changing the size of the footprints and changing the width of the swath as the spacecraft moves along the orbit track. So you can see in these two examples, there's one um, over Java in the tropics, there's one over Mali um, in the sub-Saharan region. And you can see on these two figures um, that the red swath, the OCO2 swath, is different width for these different locations. Meanwhile, the OCO3 instrument, as we discussed earlier, is mounted on a pointing mechanism assembly on the space station. So, of course, with OCO3 on the space station, we don't have the option to uh, rotate the whole space station around. There's a lot of other things going on on the space station. But we have this nice um, pointing mechanism assembly that allows the instrument, rather than the spacecraft, to be rotated as they move along the orbit track. And as a consequence, the OCO3 swath is much more uniform along the orbit track. Um, so the OCO3 swath is around 10 kilometers in width to give you an idea of the scale, um, but that just gives you, gives you a sense of the footprint on the ground. So the previous slide showed some close-up examples of the ground track of OCO2 and OCO3 measurements. Um, 
they do have quite narrow swaths on a global scale. So 10 kilometers is pretty narrow for a satellite swath. Here we can see what the sampling looks like for each of the instruments for the Western Hemisphere for a single day. And the greenish points on here show the parts of the orbit track where we have successful measurements for this day. So we're getting measurements over sunlit, cloud-free regions. For OCO2, we can see that sampling for the polar orbit um, that we saw in the animation in the earlier slide. So just as a reminder, OCO2 passes over the equator at the same local time every day at 1.30 in the afternoon, the regular 16-day repeat cycle. OCO2 is in sun sunlight in the ascending node of the orbit, which means that the direction of travel for these tracks is south to north. For OCO3, you'll remember from the animation that we showed earlier that the International Space Station is in an inclined orbit and the sampling changes over time. And we have seen very different coverage from one month to the next. Um, and the ISS does not have a predictable repeat cycle. The inclined orbit means that the sunlit part of the orbit falls at different times of day as the months go by. And it also means that the coverage shifts up and down between hemispheres. So this example happens to be in a month where the coverage is spread across both hemispheres, but you'll remember from the animation that that's not always the case for all months. But for both OCO2 and OCO3, you can see here that the coverage for an individual day is somewhat sparse. The, the narrow swath means that there are pretty large gaps between the swaths on any given day. So we're not covering... Um, you know, all of the Earth's surface as we as we move around. So the previous slides showed measurements for an example day. Um, but over time, we can build up a more complete picture. So each of the maps on this slide shows one month's worth of OCO2 measurements representing different seasons. Um, and over the, over the course of a month, you can see that we build up some more coverage. That said, you can see that there are some persistent gaps in coverage in the tropics. So when we have clouds or when we have optically thick aer aerosols, that presents challenges in measuring XCO2 in the atmospheric column. We also have some challenges when we have uneven terrain, such as mountains, um, because we, there we have difficulties in characterizing the surface pressure within the satellite footprint. And we need that surface pressure within the satellite footprint to measure XCO2. You can also see from these maps um, for the four different seasons, you can see the latitude range of OCO2 coverage moves up and down a little bit with the season. Because we're making a measurement that relies on reflected sunlight, we can only work with the daylight part of the orbit. Um, so in addition to needing there to be daylight, we also have some challenges with very high solar zenith angles. So we do have somewhat fewer successful measurements at um, higher latitudes than, say, the mid-latitudes. All right, so that was the mission recap. Now we're going to go on and talk a bit more about data quality. So you might ask in all of this, um, what what is the truth here? So we're making a remote measurement. How good is it? So as we said before, we're measuring XCO2, this column average um, mixing ratio, which is a measure of the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmospheric column as a whole. And I just want to take the time to point out here that this is not directly comparable to a measurement at a single point, such as an in situ measurement at a surface site or at a single point in the atmosphere. Those are not what their satellite is measuring. Our satellite is measuring a quantity that's an average over the whole column that it sees. So since OCO2 and OCO3 provide a measurement of average volume mixing ratio over the whole column, our ideal validation measurement to check against should also span the whole column so that we can get an apples to apples comparison. One key source of validation data that we use for these satellite missions is ground-based solar viewing spectrometers. The Total Carbon Column Observing Network, or TCON, um, has a number of carefully calibrated high resolution Bruker spectrometers in ground sites around the world. Some of these are in buildings, 
like this one up here at the California Institute of Technology. Um, others are out in containers at more remote sites like this one in Park Falls, Wisconsin. Um, so these ground-based spectrometers can be used to derive estimates of XCO2, column average CO2, that um, are used as a long-term reference for OCO2 and OCO3. In recent years, um, a more portable version of these ground-based spectrometers has become available from Brooker, um, so-called EM27 sun measurements. Um, these have been used extensively in targeted campaigns and to set up small networks that can be used to evaluate small-scale spatial gradients, such as those in urban areas. Um, and that's what that middle picture indicates. We can also use in situ measurements of the CO2 profile to calculate a column average CO2 value, provided the profile measurements cover enough of the atmospheric column. Um, NOAA do have a program of balloon borne measurements with an instrument called AirCore. And the AirCore measurements can be used to get profiles that cover um, around 99% of the atmospheric column and provide a really excellent reference for satellite value validation. There are also a range of in situ profile measurements that are possible from aircraft. Um, in general, it's difficult to get aircraft profiles that go high enough as we would like for satellite validation. Ideally, we want profiles that extend up to 14 kilometers or higher. Um, and campaigns that do that with aircraft are rare, but there are some examples out there. So I had mentioned the TCON network which is a network of ground-based Fourier transform spectrometers. Um, and the TCON network really provides the keystone of validation for OCO2 and OCO3. These spectrometers record direct solar spectra in the near infrared. Um, they make it possible to retrieve very accurate and precise column average abundances of CO2. So the XCO2 quantity that we need for validation of OCO2 and OCO3 measurements. It's really an essential validation resource for OCO2 and OCO3, but also for other satellite missions. Um, examples are the greenhouse gas observing satellites, GOSAT and GOSAT2, um, and also they provide other gases, CO, methane, others that are used for validation of, for example, the Sentinel-5P instrument Tropomi, um, the TANSAT missions, other missions. So for more information and the latest information on TCON, um, there is a TCON wiki, which I'll put a link in at the bottom there. So we can validate the data once we have the data, but how, how do we get to that product that we want to validate? So I showed this flowchart previously. We have the level 1b radiance spectra, and we start by pre-screening those to check for very obvious cloud or aerosol contamination. We do that by looking at measurements in the A band. Um, that 0.76 micron band is very sensitive to clouds and strong aerosols. The measurements that pass that pre-screening are processed through to level two. And the fraction of data that pass the pre-screening step does vary according to location and season. I've just shown at the map here we see the fraction of OCO2 glint mode sounding that passed pre-screening for one example month for June 2016. So you can just see that the fraction of soundings that pass pre-screening varies quite a lot according to location. It also varies with season. So we do that pre-screening to remove measurements that are strongly contaminated by clouds and aerosols. And if we deem them to be strongly contaminated, then we don't process them all the way to level two. Um, so that results about 70% about of our measurements are removed from consideration in that step. And these measurements that are pre-screened are never reported in the level two light XCO2 data products that most users um, that we're recommending for you to use. We do then perform additional filtering to flag measurements that have more minor cloud and aerosol contamination. Um, and around 15% of the remaining pre-screened measurements are flagged in that additional filtering step. 
So the measurements with minor contamination are still reported in the level two light products, but they're flagged as suspects to, to give the users um, the opportunity to use them if they wish, but we advise um, to use caution. So there's more information about that in the level two data user guide. Um, so we have that quality flag. And zero is good, and one is bad. And I'd said, in addition to the filtering and the quality flagging, the pre-screening and the quality flagging, we do perform bias correction on the XCO2 measurements. So when we talked about the color scale, I said that the CO2 variations, we're looking at very small variations against a very large background. It's a very challenging measurement to make from space. And we have found that after we process the data in our retrievals, even after filtering, the OCO2 and OCO3 XCO2 values show some dependencies on surface and atmospheric parameters, or the biases show some dependencies on surface and atmospheric parameters. So we apply a parametric bias correction to these measurements. Um, and then in the light files that we recommend that you use, the bias corrected XCO2 values are supplied. If you are de interested in the gory details of the parametric bias correction, you can find some more information in this paper by Chris O'Dell et al. Um, and there's also more information in the data user guide. So then after all this um, work, you might ask, are there still remaining biases in OCO2 and OCO3 XCO2 data? Um, I mean, the good news is that when you look at the light products, you're already looking at something that's been pre-screened, you have a quality flag, we've already done our best effort at bias correction. But as a caveat to that, I'll say that um, there are very few in situ or remote sensing measurements that can be used for rigorous validation in the regions where the satellite XCO2 measurements show the largest differences from the global models. So we've given it our best shot, but uh, just bear in mind that we don't have a perfect validation network. So here's some results of validation that we have done. As I said, the TCON network is the cornerstone of our validation efforts for the OCO2 and OCO3 missions. This figure shows um, comparisons of XCO2 from OCO2 target observations and estimates from the TCON network for a range of different sites, which are shown in the different symbols colors here. Um, and the main point of this figure is just to show that um, there's no significant trend uh, in the time variation of OCO2 compared to TCON. So the quality of the OCO2 XCO2 product has remained uniform over the mission life. You can see there is some scatter on these measurements. So if we assume that TCON is truth, we do have some scatter around zero. I'll say a bit more about what those numbers are. Um, but we don't see a time dependence in OCO2. For OCO3, um, the latest public data version includes a correction to account for some time dependent L1B calibration issues. We have had some more challenges with the OCO3 um, calibration than we have with OCO2. So we have included a correction in the data product to account for that. So the previous slide showed um, the consistency of the XCO2 measurement from OCO2 with TCON over time. This is a figure where we're looking at the consistency across different locations. So these are comparisons of OCO2, XCO2 with TCON um, for the different kinds of measurements, so for measurements over land, measurements over ocean, and measurements from the target mode. And these are all the different TCON sites um, arranged by latitude. So you can 
you can see here that overall we do have good consistency across the different latitudes. And just to give you a sense of the estimated accuracy, so for version 11.1 .1 OCO2, which is our latest and greatest publicly available data set, um, the differences between OCO2 and TCON are less than 0.8 parts per million by volume. And for OCO3 version 10.4, which is our latest publicly available data set, the TCON differences between OCO3 and TCON are less than 1 ppm. So overall, that gives you a sense of the accuracy. And again, I'll just look at this map and reiterate. So that's for the sites, for the locations where we have these ground-based spectrometers. But you can see that there are large areas of the globe, especially in the tropics, over the oceans, at high latitudes, where um, we don't have a huge amount of validation data to compare with. You might also wonder whether you can combine OCO2 and OCO3 data. The answer is yes, you should feel free to combine the two data sets. Um, this is, there was some work by um, Taylor et al that was published last year that showed that direct comparisons between OCO2 and OCO3 for match sounding show agreement within 0.5 parts per million by volume, which is within the agreement of either sensor with the reference TCON data. And these maps are just showing um, example OCO2 and OCO3 global maps for the same month. So you can see this is OCO2 data for April 2020. This is OCO3 data globally for April 2020. Um, this is OCO2 for August 2020 and OCO3 for August 2020. So you can see there's good visual correspondence between these maps. And um, I can also tell you that the detailed comparisons show very good agreement. And just to reiterate again also that the OCO2 and OCO3 data sets are complementary in coverage. Um, this is another way of looking at the density of the OCO2 and OCO3 observations. Um, you can see um, a heat map of the number of soundings. This is land soundings on the top and ocean soundings on the bottom. And this is OCO2 on the left and OCO3 on the right. So you can see that the OCO2 coverage is more uniform with time, um, but the OCO3 measurements have higher density of um, observations in particular regions and times, particularly over the Northern Hemisphere land where um, a lot of the anthropogenic sources are. So I've made some reference to data versions. Um, you might ask why are there different versions of OCO2 and OCO3 data? Um, if you go and look on the NASA Data Center um, and you go digging, you will see that there are different versions. So the reason for this is that over the lifetime of the missions, we've had opportunities to improve both the calibration of the instruments and the data processing algorithms. So over time, we have done a number of reprocessing campaigns where we have reprocessed the full data record in order to incorporate improvements. Um, and just to say, we recommend that you use the newest version of the level two light XCO2 files that are available. For OCO2, this should be version 11.1 .1 at this point in time. For OCO3, that latest and greatest publicly available version is version 10.4. All right, so let's talk a little bit now about interpretation of the data. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the structure of CO2 in the atmosphere. So as we said before, OCO2 and OCO3 are measuring an average over the full vertical column. But in reality, there is some vertical structure in the CO2 mixing ratio profile. Um, and reasons for that structure are um, sources, such as urban emissions, 
So sources would cause there to be more CO2 at the surface than there is higher up in the atmosphere. Um, sinks are also a consideration, for example, uptake by vegetation. So sinks would cause there to be um, lower volume mixing ratio at the surface than there is higher in the atmosphere. And also, of course, you can get mixing and transport from other locations when you're looking at any particular point in space. So it is possible to make measurements of this vertical structure with in situ instrumentation um, on, say, balloons or aircraft. Um, but we're not making measurements of that kind of vertical structure from OCO2 and OCO3. And I thought this was a nice figure to show. This is model profiles, actually, but this is model profiles of atmospheric CO2 over Sadankala in Finland for the year of 2018. And the different colours here show different times of year. So you're going from winter to summer to winter again. And you can see that over Sadankala, which is a relatively high latitude site, um, in the winter time, you have more CO2 at the surface. As you go into the growing season in the summertime, you can see the uptake by plants show, means that the CO2 at the surface starts to get lower. And then as you go back into the winter again, um, you get these higher values. So you can see that most of the variation in the CO2 profile is near the surface. You get some um, variation higher up. And if you were to take the column average, you would see um, influence from the surface as well as um, higher up in the atmosphere. But again, the biggest variability is near the surface. So now let's talk a little bit more about the vertical sensitivity of CO2 measurements from space. So I said it before, I'll say it again, that OCO2 and OCO3 measurements are sensitive to CO2 throughout the atmospheric column. And this statement is generally true for spectrally resolved measurements that are made in the near infrared region of the spectrum. So this is for OCO2, OCO3, and also for instruments like GOSAT. So these types of observations that are sensitive to the full column are suitable for the use in estimation of surface sources and sinks. You might have also seen there are spaceborne measurements of CO2 from spectrometers measuring in thermal infrared wavelengths. Um, examples include AIRS, CRIS, and YAZI. So those satellite measurements in the thermal infrared CO2 bands are primarily sensitive to CO2 in the mid and upper troposphere. So they're mostly sensitive to dynamics and transport. Um, since they don't have sensitivity to CO2 close to the surface, they're less connected to the surface sources and sinks in a given region. So we can describe the vertical sensitivity of a remotely sensed measurement by something called an averaging kernel. The averaging kernel provides a measure of how and where the remotely sensed measurement is sensitive to the true atmospheric state. Now this figure with the red and blue lines on this side shows example averaging kernels for the OCO emissions. So OCO2 or OCO3 would be in blue and the AIRS instrument, which um, is a thermal infrared measurement that's shown in red. So this averaging kernel is telling you where the measurement is sensitive. And what this is showing is, is that OCO2 has reasonably uniform sensitivity throughout most of the column. It drops off a bit towards the top of the atmosphere. The AIRS thermal infrared measurements are sensitive mainly in this mid to upper troposphere, and they have very limited sensitivity close to the surface. So if you think back to the figure on the previous slide that shows the example CO2 profiles, you'll recall that there's a lot of variation in the lowest few kilometers of the atmosphere due to the drawdown from the plants in the summer and the buildup of um, CO2 sources in the winter. So the near infrared measurements with the sensitivity closer to the surface are better able to capture that kind of variation than the thermal infrared measurements. I will also just point out here that the averaging kernel does depend somewhat on the surface and atmospheric state. Um, the column averaging kernels, which show the sensitivity of the function of pressure, 
are provided as part of the OCO2 and OCO3 data products. So you do have that information in the product files. Um, So then we talked about near infrared and thermal infrared satellite measurements. Um, if we just stick to talking about satellite observations of CO2 in the near infrared, um, I just wanted to spend a little time talking about some of the different missions that are out there in addition to OCO2 and OCO3. The Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, or CEOS, um, make a distinction of different categories of different satellite observations of CO2. So CEOS make the distinction between so-called global mappers and facility scale plume mon monitors. And OCO2 and OCO3 fall in the global mapper ca category. So these are missions that are typically undertaken by space agencies. Um, they can provide information about natural sources and sinks and anthropogenic sources and sinks um, on scales from large urban areas to sort of national scales. Um, they don't have the resolution spatially to attribute emissions from individual facilities usually unless it's a very isolated and strong emission. Um, but they do have the precision and accuracy that are needed to track um, sources and sinks that are diffuse such as um, the sinks from the biosphere and oceans. There's another category um, of so-called facility scale plume monitors, which um, can track very intense plumes of CO2 with very high spatial resolution, but they don't necessarily have the precision accuracy or coverage that we're looking at with the global greenhouse gas mappers. So this is a figure that I took from the CEOS um, Greenhouse Gas Mission Handbook. And this is showing the greenhouse gas mappers that are up there flying right now. CEOS are trying to track greenhouse gas missions. I'll say not all of the information in this figure is completely up to date. So the purple line is supposed to rec represent the current day, which is July 2024. Um, the green lines for GOSAT and um, GOSAT 2 had stopped before then. So I'll just say um, there may be things on here that are not quite up to date, but this is to give you a sense of the range of satellite missions that are up there, both current and planned. And again, this is a, this is a figure showing timelines for the missions in the global mappers category of which OCO2 and OCO3 are examples, and also GOSAT. Um, and I highlight these three missions here, OCO2, OCO3, and GOSAT, because I'll just say that the NASA algorithm that's used for OCO2 and OCO3 has in the past been applied to GOSAT spectral measurements, and that resulting um, ACOS GOSAT dataset is publicly available on the NASA data centers and has been widely util utilized. So I'll highlight those, and then I'll also show, um, just to give you a sense, this is um, the equivalent figure for the so-called facility scale plume monitors. Again, these are um, instruments that can track intense plumes of CO2. And they must have a very high spatial resolution of one square kilometers or finer, but um, they don't have the precision, accuracy, or coverage of the global greenhouse gas mappers. So we talked about a little bit about GOSAT, and you might ask what's different about the CO2 records from GOSAT and OCO2. GOSAT was launched back in 2009, and the instrument's been providing high-quality measurements ever since. OCO2 was launched in 2014, um, so 10 years of data, not as long as the GOSAT record, but the OCO2 record provides about 100 times as many samples every day as GOSAT. Um, although, again, you know, we saw that OCO2 still has 10 kilometer swath, pretty narrow swath. We should perhaps think of it more as a global sampler than a global mapper. Um, but it falls in the global, both of these fall in the global mapper 
um, category under CIOS. So you can see these maps here just to get a sense of the coverage from GOSAT and OCO2 for a month. All right, just to talk a bit more about data processing levels, um, this is uh, a NASA definition of data processing levels. Um, we talked about level 1B spectra, um, and we have talked a little bit about level 2 XCO2 products. Um, so the level 2 is generally, we take it to mean that it's a product that's provided at the same resolution and location as the level 1B source data. There are also level 3 gridded products, um, where the XCO2 or the SIF can be provided on uniform space-time grids. Um, and then there's also level 4, which um, are often fluxes, CO2 fluxes, that are inferred using inversion models. Um, level 4 can also mean XCO2 fields that are derived from multiple measurements. So just to show you a couple of different examples of higher level products. Um, so we saw that the level 2 products from OCO2 and OCO3 have some gaps in coverage due to the narrow ground track and due to the cloud and aerosol contamination. Um, so there are various possible approaches for um, gap filling and producing gridded fields. There are averaging approaches, there are um, so-called Krieging approaches, um, and this can also be done via data assimilation. Um, this figure here, so the top figure shows 16 days of OCO2 level 2 data. Um, the lower figure shows the result of an assimilation of OCO2 level 2 product um, into the GEOS model to make gridded level 3 fields. So I'll just point out um, that this level 3 GEOS product shown here is also pub publicly available on the NASA data center. Um, so level three gives you a means to fill the gaps, but it also brings in some kind of model component. This is an example of a product on the NASA data center that is um, labeled as level four. So this is a product that um, combines OCO2 and GOSAT measurements. Um, and the figure here shows um, this fused OCO2 GOSAT product for one day. Um, and this is this is a product that was uh, created using a so-called Krieging approach. Um, if you're interested, you can go check out um, the data set on the NASA data center and put a link there. Um, so this is an example of level four because it combines different types of measurements. I said level four is very often taken to mean CO2 fluxes, and um, you will be learning more about some of the level four flux products that are available in part two of this training. So just um, as we come to a close, just a few thoughts on what we can do with OCO2 and OCO3 data. So, so far, these data have been used to provide global measurements of how atmospheric CO2 is changing over time and how to quantify um, the way that CO2 emissions are being offset by natural carbon sinks. With OCO2 10-year record and OCO3's five-year record, um, we now have the length of record that we need to show the two-way interactions between carbon and climate, and you'll hear more about that in part two. Um, and the OCO2 and OCO3 measurements have also been used to demonstrate that spaceborne measurements can be used to quantify CO2 emissions from power plants and cities. You'll hear more about that in part three. And with that, I'll bring to a close and I'll hand back over to Erica. In summary, OCO2 and OCO3 make measurements of XCO2, which is the column average volume mixing ratio of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It provides a measure of the average amount of gas in a vertical column above a given location. And OCO2 and OCO3 XCO2 measurements are comparable 
there are long-term stable XCO2 records that can ad be used to address carbon cycle science, 10 years of OCO2 data and five years of OCO3 data. The OCO2 and OCO3 measurements provide complementary coverage and sampling. So as mentioned, OCO2 is in, in its own satellite and it uh, obtains uh, global measurements of XCO2 every 16 days. So it passes over the equator on a daily basis at 1.30 p.m. local time. Now, OCO3 is in the, it's, it's a sensor on the International Space Station. It's an, in an inclined orbit, which is not predictable. So the same point can have uh, measurements of XCO2 during different times of the day. The, uh, we recommend that users use the level two light XCO2 products, and these are filtered and bias corrected, and they are publicly available through the NASA guest disk uh, data server. If you have any questions, please feel free to get in touch with Dr. Vivian Payne through the email here that you see. And uh, we've also posted the uh, website for this training, as well as the RSET website and our Twitter handle. And looking at tomorrow's session, which is on the impact of drought on CO2, uh, from atmospheric CO, we'll be looking at atmospheric CO2 measurements as well as uh, CO2 fluxes. And by the end of tomorrow's session, you'll be able to identify the effects of El Nino that create regional drought conditions and monitor global fluxes of atmospheric CO2 concentrations in order to identify areas that are vulnerable. You'll be using OCO2 data to visualize areas that are impacted by drought and you'll be able to perform an interpretive and comparative analysis, as well as um, to identify the methods and processes to derive fluxes with atmospheric CO2 measurements, and then interpret regional flux perturbations and fluxes and emissions at the country scale. We'll show you how to clone the RSET GitHub repository and maintain the local code. This concludes session one. Thank you, Dr. Payne, for that very informative and excellent presentation. And thank you to all of the participants. We have been gathering your questions and we will now start the question and answer session. Great, so now we will be sharing with you the questions that you have already been submitting and we will uh, try to get through all of them. If we don't get through all of the questions, we will answer them on the Google Doc and we will be posting the Google Doc on the training webpage. So let's just start from the top down. Uh, Dr. Vivian will be answering the questions. I will be reading them. So let's start with the first question. Does anyone have an estimate for massive scaling of kelp farms as sinks? Dr. Uh, Payne? Sorry, I was struggling with the unmute button there. Um, so I saw the question come up. Um, I did see there's a, there was a paper from 2016 with an estimate from, of the natural sequestration of carbon per year from seaweed. Um, so seaweed can be quite a large sink, but if you compare that to the magnitude of the carbon released from fossil fuel burning, um, it, it's still relatively small. So, so just while we were in the seminar, um, I was trying to look up some numbers. Um, the numbers I saw suggest that seaweed accounts for something like 2 to 3% of the natural uptake of carbon. So that gives you some sense of how massive the scaling would have to be in order to, um, you know, sequester the amount of carbon that we're releasing into the atmosphere from fossil fuels. 
So I hope that reference is useful and that helps to answer your question. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question, what happens when we assume dry air for VMR measurement? So the variations in carbon dioxide are pretty small relative to the background. So it's always important to be clear about definitions, but it's particularly important to be clear when you're talking about such small variations. Um, for uh, other gases and in certain model contexts, you might see trace gas volume mixing ratios defined relative to total air sometimes, which includes the water vapor component. But of course, water vapor can vary widely with season and location. Um, and so we choose to report our measurements as relative to dry air. Um, but I mainly gave that information just so you would know exactly what the definition is, so that if you want to compare with something else, you can compare like with like. Great. Question number three. Can we open the OCO2, OCO3 uh, data XCO2 files with Panoply and export them in a format that is compatible with Google Earth Engine? Has this method been changed in any other way? with direct data repo? So I'm going to point that question over to Karen Nguyen, if Karen's available to answer. Yeah, I am. Hi. So, yes, yeah, since uh, the files are available um, at, from the DAC, you download them as a NetCDF. So, yes, you can export them and um, you can open it with Panoply. Um, Exporting them in a file format is compatible with Google Earth Engine. I believe Google Earth Engine still uses GeoTIFF. I need to check on that. And if that is the case, we naturally need to do an additional conversion. We do have a um, notebook that was created um, that is that has not been added to the uh, to the current GitHub on our set. So we'll have to do that to show folks how to do that. But yes, there is there's an additional step that needs to be done. If you wanted to directly plop it onto Google Earth Engine, but I do want to say, as it, uh, Vivian had mentioned in in the presentation, um, you need to be mindful of what you're exporting because we have such skinny swaths that um, it may not be what you're used to seeing. So that's the the caveat: um, how much data you're actually adding to Google Earth Engine. Um, so yeah. Thank you very much for that, Karen. Uh, for those that um, uh, do not know Karen, she is one of the guest lecturers for this training, and she is part of the OCO2, OCO3 team. You'll be hearing more from her during tomorrow's presentation and on the last session as well. Uh, and just to confirm, yes, indeed, Google Earth Engine does take in uh, TIFF files. Okay, so we carry on to the next question. Number four, the XCO2 data consists of individual data points and can be downloaded in NetCDF format. Will this training cover the process of exporting data in raster format? Panoply just visualizes the data and displays the coordinates of the data. However, the area is not completely covered. So I took a stab at answering this and I'll also look to Karen if Karen wants to add anything to um, what I've written here, but I, I come back to pointing to the, the relatively uh, narrow swaths of the, um, of the OCO2 and OCO3 data sets. So the swaths are 10 kilometers wide. We saw in the presentation that there are quite large gaps between the swaths. Um, from the satellite measurements. Um, if you want to try to look at some products that come that cover all areas, you can look at level three products, but you should bear in mind that there's always some kind of assumption needed about how you're filling the gaps in between the measurements. Um, and my understanding is this training is not going to cover downloading in raster format, but I'll I'll look to Karen and see if she wants to add anything there. Yeah, we're not covering that that um that would have to be done through a notebook that I will 
since this is two questions in a row, I'll make sure that notebook gets uploaded. Um, but we are working directly with our NetCDF files. Um, like I said before, there is an additional processing step to get into a GeoTIFF for you to, to be able to work on that. So um, I will do a follow up. Thank you. Thank you to both of you for that. So the next question, the number five, are the OCO2 and OCO3 XCO2 data paired with GPS moisture data? So there is no pairing with GPS moisture data. Um, I will say that the OCO2 and OCO3 instruments are sensitive to variations in the total column water vapor because there are water vapor lines in the spectral range in amongst all the CO2 lines. Um, so there are water vapor total column estimates supplied as part of the data products. Um, and if those are of interest to people. Great. So question number six, why are the OCO3 data in the Earth Data platform only available until November 2023? Is it possible to get 2024 OCO3 data? So this is a timely question. Thank you for answering, asking this question. Um, so the, the International Space Station has a limited number of slots where science instruments can, can take their measurements. Um, originally, OCO3 had a, a two-year mission lifetime. It, it's been returning a lot of interesting measurements. The mission got extended, which is great. Um, but as part of that extension, we did have to go into storage for a few months in order to allow another instrument to use that um, space on the space station to complete its mission. Um, but we're very happy to report that on July 4th, OCO3 was reinstalled in its slot on the space station. Um, so there were no measurements between, you know, while the measurement was in store, while the instrument, sorry, was in storage, there were no measurements taken in that time between November and this recent reinstallation. Um, there's checks underway right now. We're performing this in orbit checkout process to make sure that everything's working properly on the instrument. Um, and we're allowing some time for that, but we should expect that OCO3 measurements will start flowing again within 90 days and quite probably before that. So thank you for asking that. Indeed, very timely. Next question. Is developing a TCON project something that can be done with a university? Do you have an idea about its wavelength coverage and how much the in instrument costs? So yes, um, TCON sites are run by universities. There are a number of the TCON sites that are run by universities. Um, I'll say that the requirements for participation in the TCON network are pretty stringent. Um, there's a wiki page for TCON. If you're interested in scoping out what the possibilities are for starting a TCON site, I would encourage you to check out the wiki page and reach out to um, the steering committees for the TCON. So the TCON spectrometers are Brooker 125HR instruments. They are expensive instruments, large instruments. Um, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb. You'd have to contact Brooker to see exactly what the cost is, but I think of the order of half a million dollars. Um, the spectral range for the TCON network, I think the minimum spectral range that's required is 4,000 to 9,000 wave numbers in first centimeters. Um, although many of the sites do have instruments that have coverage that goes beyond that. So that's the Brooker 125HR. Um, I'll also say that there are a number of smaller, more portable and somewhat less expensive spectrometers that um, are increasingly being used for ground-based remote sensing of greenhouse gases. We uh, have been very interested in recent years on OCO2 and OCO3 and ex exploring the kind of validation and science opportunities from um, complementary measurements from these kind of instruments. So examples that I would cite here are the Brooker EM27 Suns, um, also the Brooker Vertex 70 is something that um, some of our science community are starting to explore. Um, so I'd, 
would encourage you to check out those possibilities. And those, again, you know, university groups are setting up things on rooftops and um, doing some, you know, great work with localised networks. So definitely things that universities can get involved with. I'll also put in a plug, I'll say that um, the map of TCON sites, so in terms of the satellite satellite validation measurements, there are areas of the world that are better covered than others. So North America and Europe are pretty well covered. Um, sites in um, South Asia and the tropics um, in Africa would be of particular interest because we, we really don't have a lot of validation measurements in those regions, but there's some really um, interesting things going on in the carbon cycle in those places. So. Um, that's just an additional comment. Okay, question number eight. What, why does AIRS have the peak at six kilometers, 500 millibars? What physics do we see here? So the thermal infrared sounding of the atmosphere relies on variations in the temperature profiles and how we sample the spectral lines. So you get information about different altitudes by sampling um, different parts of the spectral line. And some of some of that sensitivity of the thermal measurement then depends on having good temperature difference, a good lapse rate and a good temperature difference between the surface and the part of the atmosphere that you want to see and the, the nature of the physics is such that by the time you get up to 500 millibars or six kilometers, you have um, a good thermal contrast between the surface and the temperature of the atmosphere, and that allows you to distinguish variations in CO2. Um, so that that's the physics that's going on there. I can try to word that more coherently for, <laughs> for the record. Um, Great, thank you for that. Number nine, what is the accuracy of the measurements compared to test CO2 measurements? So the test CO2 measurements, um, test like airs was a thermal infrared sounder. So first point is that the test CO2 measurements are sensitive mainly in the mid to upper troposphere, whereas the OCO2 and OCO3 measurements are sensitive to the entire column. Um, the other thing is that um, I think with the test CO2, I was involved in, in that to some degree, the test CO2, we had to average over um, 10 degree latitude by 30 degree longitude bins to get um, the measurement precision down to something that was useful. So I'll say to, to get to something like one or two ppm, and I forget the numbers, but I can look them up for the record. Um, we, we had to do extensive spatial averaging, whereas with the OCO2 and OCO3 measurements, the single footprint, so the one by two kilometer footprint, approximately you're getting a precision and accuracy below one part per million. So, so they're much more precise and accurate in addition to having um, coverage, you know, vertical sensitivity that lets you be sensitive to the surface sources and sinks. Great. Moving on to the next question. Is the column measurement a 3D volume or is it a one or 2D length? And in either case, how do you get from a measurement to a concentration? That's a great question. They might be hearing a little bit more about this tomorrow, but please go ahead. <laughs> so the column measurement, I mean, it is the, the instrument is viewing some kind of 3D chunk of the atmosphere, but you might think of it more as a, as over the path, let's see. I think that the column average is the average over the vertical. So you should you should think of the column average 
as an average over the vertical, even though the atmosphere, the, the, the instrument's viewing a 3D chunk, but we're assuming that that it's one one spot on the Earth. So you should think of it as a um, just a vertical dimension. And then this question about how you get from a measurement to a concentration. Molecules per length cube. So what we're measuring from space is a spectrum of radiance. And how we get from that radiance measurement to a column average CO2 measurement, um, there's a that's what the level two retrieval algorithm does. Um, and if if you're interested, I can add some references after the fact to this Google Doc to give more information about that process. Okay, question number 11. Are the product files publicly available? Yes, <laughs> that's an easy one. Um, so there are links, I think, in the presentation files to the location of these data products at the um, the JazzDisk, the NASA Data Center, where we make these publicly available. And question number twelve: How can we access CO two plumes for specific regions? So I'm just thinking about how best to answer this. I'll say. Um, What if you're particularly interested in plumes, then the OCO3 snapshot area maps are probably a data set of great interest. We do have a website that's dedicated specifically to the OCO3 snapshot area maps, the observations that are available over particular locations. You'll hear more about this in part three of the training. Um, but I can also add, you know, the the air, the website for the snapshot area maps for OCO3 into this Google Doc after the fact, and and there are a number of different sites. So so some are power plants that we've been targeting. Some are large urban areas. Um, yeah, I I can I can add more information into this Google Doc. Great. Next question. If the gaps are 10 kilometers, what does it mean that the spatial resolution is 1.29 to 2.25? So that's a good question. Across, so across the swath, so it's a 10 kilometer wide swath. And across that swath, we have eight spatial footprints. So within the 10 kilometers, there are eight, eight footprints. So um, and I think we said in the training with OCO2, the width of the swath actually varies as we go around the orbit. With OCO3, it's more constant. But but the reason for the difference between 10 kilometers and the one to two kilometers is that there are eight cross-track spatial footprints in a swath. Okay, question 14. How long are OCO2 and OCO3 data uh, or the sensors expect it to last? So that's a great question. I'll say that both instruments uh, um, are in excellent health. Um, every year we take a look at, you know, lifetime estimates. Um, there's nothing on either instrument that we have any expectation to fail anytime soon. Um, since OCO3 is on the space station. Um, we do have permission to operate until the end of life of the space station, which we expect to be in 2029, 2030. So if all goes well, we could have OCO3 keep going until 2029, 2030. Um, OCO2 is on its own spacecraft. We have enough fuel to keep that going safely until 2045 or thereabouts. Um, that would be that would be amazing. I'd, I'd, um, 
but you know we we can I, I can't necessarily predict, but I'll just say things are in excellent health and we have no reason to expect anything to fail anytime soon. So as long as we um, are allowed to continue our operations and the instruments are working, we will do so. That's super great news. Question 15, is there an agreed model for the Paris Accord? That is a question. So I can I can pass to Jinji to see if she wants to say any more about that. Um, I might be inclined to try and answer that after the fact. Jinji, is there anything you want to say about that? Yeah, um, that's a very good question. So um, currently, the UN United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change (UNFCCC) uh, has a set of a framework for each country to report their emissions, basically based on the bottom-up approach, that's based on the activity data and the emission factors. So that's the agreed upon approach for Paris Accord. But of course, um, the one of the goals for us is to use atmospheric CO2 data to inform the emission changes uh, from the, each country. So the uh, the as part of the Paris Agreement, there is a carbon stock uh, carbon stock change uh, uh, um, uh, activities. So the first carbon stock take is. 2023. Uh, so, OCO203 team has generated a data set, country level uh, carbon emission data set we have uh, submitted to this first carbon stock change. Um, so, this is carbon stock take is exercise to assess the agreement, the, the progress of all the countries toward this uh, Paris uh, climate goals. So, the short answer is that there is no agreed upon one model to. Um, uh, for the Paris Accord, but our team is trying to generate the data set that could be used as part of the Paris Accord. Thank you for chiming in. For those that do not know, Dr. Yunji Lu, she's the science team lead for the OCO2, OCO3 missions, and she will be presenting uh, tomorrow. Um, so, uh, something to look forward to. Question 16, can these products be used to report the NDC commitment of countries? Is the efficiency of these products reliable enough to, to inform emissions that are being reported for countries? So again, I think I might point this one to Jinji since she is being extensively involved in the carbon stock take effort. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, so I, I will point you to a study that our team has, um, published last year. We specifically use the OCO2, uh, data to assess the carbon emissions at the country level. So with the goal to inform, um, the, the, the emission changes, especially over the developing countries where. The data is quite sparse from the uh, surface. Um, so I will add the reference in the Google Doc and then you can check later on. And there is uncertainty estimates as part of the study. So you can see how uh, efficient, how accurate of our flux inversion based on the uh, cell observation. And, and maybe just to add to that, I think there's um, there are different methods in place I think we're not saying that the satellite based products can provide all the answers here, but I think the the way that people are thinking about this is that there's complementary information in the you know, bottom up reporting from inventories um, and from the remotely sensed products and the way forward would probably involve using both together. Right. I think the especially for the bottom up approach that Vivian alluded to has less observation coverage over the region that um, over the region where the observation coverage is sparse, the cell observation probably have more advantage, have can provide more information. Great, thank you. The next question 
The OCO2 and OCO3 were shown to be in agreement within 0 0.5 parts per million. How well do OCO and GOSAT measurements agree with each other and with TCON? So that's a great question. Um, there have been studies, and I can add some references um, about OCO2 and GOSAT comparisons. Um, we have done work where we applied the same level two algorithm to the OCO and GOSAT radiances. Um, and I want to say that the agreements within one PPM, I can double check the studies and add the references. Um, and the agreement between OCO2, OCO3 and TCON. So the agreement with TCON for OCO2 is better than one part per million. I think we usually say like 0.8 parts per million or so, um, and more like one part per million for OCO3. And then the GOSAT measurements with PCON also show very good agreement, but I, I'll have to I'll have to check the references. But I I will add references after the fact and check the numbers and put some more information in here. Okay, the next question. At the policy level, we usually analyze emissions from all anthropogenic sources, including methane. In this case, does OCO2 or OCO3 have the capabilities to collect methane or other ozone depleting data? If not, can you recommend how to fill this data gap? So OCO2 and OCO3 are measurements targeted specifically at carbon dioxide. We do not have information in the spectra on methane. Um, for methane data specifically, um, I think in one in one of the slides I pointed to the CIOS handbook. Um, there are a number of other satellites measuring methane. Um, one that is particularly complementary to OCO2 and OCO3 is the TROPOMI instrument on the Sentinel 5P satellite. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'll I'll add the link to the CIOS handbook for methane satellite measurements, you know, in, into the Google Doc. Um, the, there's another part of the question about ozone depleting data. I mean, there are a huge number of satellites measuring both stratospheric and tropospheric ozone and ozone depleting substances in the stratosphere. I can also point to some references there, um, but I'll just say that there's a, there's a wealth of satellite information out there um, from other instruments also. Okay, question number 19. How can we ensure that the data from these missions are accessible and usable for researchers in developing countries? So just use this to, to point again to all of these NASA data products are publicly freely accessible um, through NASA data centers, OCO2 and OCO3, it's the JESDISC data center. Um, so anybody from any country um, can access these data for free. Great, and the next question number 20, um, will the homework include analysis of data and graphs? And I can chime in onto that. The homework will include questions from each of the sessions, as well as some questions about the demos. Uh, would you like to add anything else? No, I think that's great. Okay. Question 21. What are the main sources of uncertainty in XCO2 measurements from OCO2 and OCO3? And how are these uncertainties quantified and minimized? That's a great question. I'll say um, one of the one of the big sources of uncertainty in the XCO2 measurements from these instruments is aerosols 
So aerosols um, interfere with our signal in a subtle way. Um, we can screen out the cases where there's really strong and obvious contribution from aerosols, but there are a lot of cases where it's less it's less clear. Uh, also, aerosols are one. I'll say um, uncertainties in the surface albedo or variations in the surface albedo are another sort of driving source of uncertainty. Um, also, the input spectroscopy that's used in the algorithm. So I'll say there are we're trying to make a very very accurate measurement. Um, and at the level we're trying to measure the CO2, it puts challenges on what we know about the physics of the spectroscopic line shapes. So that's that's definitely still an area that's being worked on. So you ask about how these uncertainties are quantified and minimized. Um, so from the spectroscopy point of view, there are efforts underway with new laboratory studies to try and pin down some of these uncertainties with things like the aerosols and the albedo uncertainties. Um, what I'll say about that is that the comparisons to reference measurements, such as those from the TCON network, are a key piece in quantifying those uncertainties. Um, and trying to correct for them via the bias correction. So the TCON instruments being on the ground and looking up, it's a direct sun measurement, so it's much less impacted by aerosol interference. And of course, since you're looking up, you don't have problems associated with characterizing the surface. So using, using the TCON um, and other kinds of like balloon-borne and aircraft reference measurements are a key part of quantifying and minimizing the uncertainties in the geophysical parameters. And along those lines, the next question, what is the margin of error of the measurements? So the requirement going into the OCO2 mission, the requirement for accuracy and precision of column average CO2 to measure regional scale sources and sinks of CO2 is, was one part per million in X CO2. And we have shown that we've not only met, but we have exceeded that requirement. So the next one, in terms of data availability, are there any plans to make the data available on Google Earth Engine? I know Karen's had this question before. I might point this one to Karen. Sorry about that. I struggled with my unmute button. Um, not right now, just because uh, previously uh, in conversations, we would have to systematically provide it in a format that they can easily grab and use they being uh, Google Earth Engine. And since we, uh, the project does not do that right now, um, it's, it would be up to, the individual, up to the individual user to do that if they wanna use Google Earth Engine. Um, obviously, if there was interest again from them and there are ways to do that, that would be a different uh, situation, but currently, no. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Question 24. It was mentioned that OCO3 has a snapshot mode that focuses on an 80 by 80 kilometer region for a brief time. How are these target locations tasked? And is there a fixed schedule or is tasking dynamic, allowing response to current events such as wildfires? This is a great question and one that we have had from our science team recently also. Um, I'll say that there is a schedule that's decided in advance. Um, I think we we line these up at least a couple of weeks in advance. Um, 
part of the reason for that is is the way our mission operations works there's there's a lot of uh things to consider when operating on the space station there's a lot of other things going on on the space station and we don't always have all the control that we would ideally like um i mean the other so so we're not we're not in a position to respond to um fast moving events um but it, it's a great it's a great question it would be really uh it'd be really interesting to be able to switch the measurement plan at short notice but right now we're not in a position to do that question 25 how do the temporal coverage and revisit frequency of oco2 and 3 impact their ability to monitor seasonal and interannual variations in co2 so i'll maybe take a stab at this and maybe i'll see if jinji has anything to add um so oco2 has um a 16 day regular repeat cycle so very consistent coverage over time so therefore i'd say that um that's really ideal for monitoring the seasonal and interannual variations in co2 we have regular coverage we have a long record um for oco3 you'll remember from the little animation that was shown that the coverage uh due to the inclined orbit of the space station the coverage varies considerably with season and it's not entirely predictable so let's say oco3 um has advantages in other areas with with the um ability to look at changes with different times of day and also to look at um you know these snapshot area maps these particular targeted areas do you want to add anything Jinji? um yeah i just want to add um that because both oco2 and oco3 use reflective sunlight so that means, uh, as we mentioned in earlier, that means that it doesn't have observations during the winter time, especially when there is no sunshine. So that's um, create some trouble. Uh, like that, when we use the observation to monitor the seasonal cycle, especially over the high latitude, uh, is a little bit uh, challenging because we don't monitor, we don't have observation during the winter time. But uh, because the OCO2, OCO3 observed column integrated value, even though the footprint size is like about two kilometer by two kilometer, but the real representativeness is much larger. Um, so even with the, the seasonal observation coverage over a limited area, you could still get a very good representation of a seasonal and the interannual variations at regional uh, scales. Yeah, I think that's what I want to add. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that. The next question, how do the temporal coverage and revisit frequency of OCO2 and OCO3, oh no, sorry, uh, 26, how can we convert the volume mixing ratio like PPMV at different layers to column average VMR? So I, I can add, I can add a reference on that about how, how to convert a profile to a column average XCO2 value. Yep, it's a good question. Moving on, next question, number 27. What are the potential technological or methodolo methodological advancements for future satellite missions to overcome the current limitations um, on OCO2 and OCO3? So if we're thinking about limitations, um, we could think about a number of the limitations that we covered. One, one is the spatial coverage. Um, so we talked about the fact that the swath is somewhat narrow, so you're not getting XCO2 measurements you know, everywhere on the Earth um, for any given day. So one um, advance there is measurements with 
wider swath coverage. Um, there are a couple of things coming soon from other satellite agencies. So the European Space Agency is going to be launching a mission called CO2M, which is also going to be a near IR spectrometer, but it's going to have much wider swath coverage. And I think they're going to have three uh, platforms up there. So they'll they'll be able to cover much more of the Earth with the CO2M mission. Um, there's another mission going up soon from the Japanese Space Agency called GOSAT GW, which also has um, wider swath coverage. Um, it does remain to be seen whether those new missions are going to have the same kind of accuracy as the OCO2 and OCO3 missions, but we'll see how that plays out. Um, other limitations that people bring up, um, there's, there's coverage in areas that are cloudy that's that's one limitation so so something that we talk a lot about is coverage over areas like the amazon where there's really interesting things going on in the carbon cycle but we sample them very infrequently due to the fact that it's cloudy there so addressing uh cloud is if you have smaller spatial footprint then you would be able to see through the clouds more often. So smaller spatial footprints is another um, another potential development that would help overcome. Um, I can probably think of some more to add later, but those those are the main things that come to mind right now. Great. Question number 28. This one is related to the averaging kernel that you discussed. Is it necessary that the column averaging kernel sum up to one? Uh, I, this person is using products that do not add up to one. And what does this mean? The column averaging kernel does not need to add up to one. Um, let's see. Let me think about that a little more and give a more involved answer after the fact. Okay, moving on then to question 29. Interesting question. Does biochar have a substantial potential for mitigating CO2 emissions? I do not know the answer to that. I'm going to point that one over to Jinji to see if she has anything to add. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know either. Uh, we could look, uh, look that up and uh, uh, give you the answer afterwards. Okay, thank you. Let's move on then to question number 30. Can the OCO3 data be used for forest fire based emissions? So using the OCO2 or OCO3 data for fire emissions requires some care in that, you know, over the smoke plumes themselves, smoke plumes are high aerosol. Um, and so in high aerosol conditions, we have problems with aerosol interference in our measurement. Um, there have been studies done where we've been able to use OCO2 measurements together with measurements of carbon monoxide, CO, from um, tropomy um, to look at the you know, overall impact of fire emissions on um, you know, in, in lot, broad areas and larger timescales, right? So not, so not sort of plume specific studies or very um, small scale fire specific studies, but um, more of the accumulated effect of a strong fire season um, on, on the CO2 for that particular year. Do you want to add anything, Jinji? Uh, no, I think you answered it really, really well. Yeah. Thank you. Question number 31. What is considered the true truth atmosphere? <laughs> what is truth is a, a perpetual question. Um, I mean, the true atmosphere is, you know, what what's really there. I mean, we're all, 
any kind of measurement has some uncertainty with associated with it. Um, for OCO2 and OCO3, for the column average CO2 measurement, we tend to use the TCON remotely sensed XCO2 values as our truth reference. But of course, there's, there's still some un inherent uncertainty in the TCON estimates themselves. Um, so I think some level of uh, 0.4 parts per million uncertainty in the TCON estimates. So our, tr our truth estimate still has uncertainty. I think the best reference that we have for CO2 in the atmosphere are these um, air core balloon borne profile measurements. I think the uncertainty on a column average XCO2 value from an air core profile is of the order of 0.2 ppm. But the air cores are currently only launched in a few places. So we don't have that, um, you know, sort of gold standard reference in many places. Not sure if that answers the question, but there's a there's a shot. Thank you. Question 32. How useful is the OCO2 and OCO3 column data, which is more sensitive to at the surface? in subtropical regions with decoupled troposphere uh, by stable layers. Uh, this participant indicates that in previous studies from test CO2 profile data showed that some regions may have higher CO2 values from transported air at about 700 to 500 millibars altitude than at the surface. So this is a good question. It is definitely true that the interpretation of the XCO2 measurement requires some care. So we're seeing a column average, and that includes the impact of sources and sinks at the surface, but also, as, as this points out, the, the impacts of transport. So anytime when we're trying to use the um, satellite measurement of XCO2 to infer surface sources and sinks, there's always some piece where you need to model the transport component also. And Jinji is going to talk some more about that tomorrow. So maybe maybe it would be good to talk more about that after after part two. Question 33, policy related question. Given that OCO2 and OCO3 data are comparable, did any city utilize this data for their climate mitigation management? If there are any examples, it would be great to hear about, about them. So one thing that comes to mind here, um, there was a group at the World Bank who had used our data to um, help evaluate the impact of subway construction in I think around 200 different cities. And I can put a link um, into that study after the fact. Um, and so far, that's the main example I can think of. Um, I mean, we'd love to have more people utilizing this data, but there are always some uh, care that has to be taken in the interpretation. Do you want to add anything, Jinji? Um, I just want to add um, that um, so OCO3 observations has been considered to use by some of the US cities, such, such as uh, Los Angeles and uh, some cities in, uh, in uh, California, but it's, all these studies are in, uh, in progress uh, as for any real application, we need to demonstrate that it adds additional value uh, to their existing method. So it's definitely an area that we're actively working on, and we will be interested if you are interested to use you this data set to provide any kind of support you need. Thanks, Jinju. Okay, thank you. Question number 30. 34. In the case of solar radiation modification through stratospheric aerosol injection, 
Is there any chance that we will need to modify atmospheric corrections for, for most satellite sensors? And how do you separate different chemical signatures at, at different altitudes? So that's a great question. Um, we actually changed our algorithm for OCO2, and that's now used for OCO3. We changed our algorithm following a large um, volcanic eruption event in the Southern Hemisphere, and we added something in our algorithm to account for stratospheric aerosol. Um, so there is definitely a chance that things have to be modified to account for things that we didn't think of when we set things up in the first place. Um, different chemical signatures coming from different altitudes. The high spectral resolution of the measurement for OCO2 and OCO3 gives us some ability to separate information coming from chemical signals at different altitudes. It's not perfect, but there is some information in there. And it, from the past experience, we do think we have some ability to account for stratospheric aerosol injection. Okay, so we have a couple of minutes left. Let's see, um, well, let's go as far as we can. Uh, next question. Uh, which instrument do you prefer for inverse modeling of CO2 fluxes, OCO2 or OCO3? So my answer might be that depends what exactly that you want to do. So if you want to do global scale flux inversions, then the regular sampling of OCO2 is more straightforward to deal with. If you want to look at um, local urban scale flux inversions over a particular urban area or power plant region, then the OCO3 snapshot area map would be, you know, advantageous. Do you, do you want to add anything, Ginger? Um, no, I think you answered pretty well. I also want to add, I mean, for, for the global inversion, um, we, the team, the OCO2, OCO3 team are actively um, working on to use both OCO2 and OCO3. I mean, we recommend using OCO2 if you just started, but we encourage you use both OCO2 and OCO3 together. Thank you. Okay, thanks. The next question, who or which agency recognizes the results from your methods? I think this might be more applications um, policy related. Yeah, so I'm not sure what best to say. So clearly NASA, we work with people at NOAA, we um, have involvement with the World Meteorological Organization, the WMO. Um, there's the example that Jinji talked about earlier of the um, country level fluxes data set that was submitted to the global stock take under the Paris Agreement through the UNFCCC or UNFCCC. Um, anything else you want to say about that, Jinji, about agencies? No, I don't think so. I, I yeah, no. Um, I mean, I think through, I mean, the, I, 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 one thing I want to add, um, through NASA carbon monitoring system program, we, um, actively, uh, work with EPA, uh, like, uh, environmental protect, environmental, environmental protect agency, I think by EPA to try to, uh, see whether the OCO2, OCO3 products could be used by EPA. Okay, so I think with that, we, um, it comes to the end of this session. We're at the top of the hour. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get to answer live all of the questions, but we will answer them on the Google Doc and we will be 
posting the Google Doc on the web page, and you can refer to these. Um, also, to remind you that the uh, presentation, today's presentation, is available through our website as PDF, and we will also be posting the recording. So with that, I would like, before closing, I would like to thank all of the participants uh, for all of your super great questions and enthusiasm. Uh, I remind you that uh, there is, uh, the next session is tomorrow and it will be the impact of drought on CO2. I'd like to thank our uh, guest instructor today, Dr. Vivian Payne, for that excellent presentation and taking the questions. I'd also like to thank other members of the OCO2, OCO3 uh, team that were here helping answer the questions. Dr. Junji Liu, Karen Yuan, you'll be hearing more from them tomorrow. So tomorrow we'll have a demo, and on the third session we'll also have a demo. So it'll be a combination of uh, theoretical and demonstration. Um, but finally, I'd like to thank the RSET team uh, for all of their uh, support in getting everything together. So with that, I will close this session, and I look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow. Having, uh, wishing you all a great day, and thank you once again. Uh, be oh, and before I close, uh, Dr. Vivian Payne, would you like to say any uh, final words? I'd just like to thank all the participants today. I'd like to thank um, the RSET trainers and all the RSET team for all the prep. But um, yeah, I really, really appreciate the, the great participation and the really excellent questions. Thank you all for calling in. Thank you. It's been a, a real pleasure and honor to have you with us once again. Uh, thanks, everyone, and see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye.